Welcome to the Entra Podcast. This is your host, Michael Mara. I'm the CEO of Entra, a new professional network that we built to help you connect with new people and learn from industry experts. On this show, we interview the top CEOs, founders, investors, and creators from all over the world to have meaningful conversations about entrepreneurship and life. I hope you enjoy the show. On this episode, I interview Ike Shahadi. He is one of the most successful entrepreneurs I've ever had the pleasure of interviewing. He's the founder of Ike's Love and Sandwiches. They've grown to having over a hundred different locations across 10 different cities in the US as well as expanding internationally in Saudi Arabia. He's an amazing person. We dive into everything about his entrepreneurial and personal journey and I hope you really enjoy this episode. All right, Ike, welcome to the show, man. It's so good to see you. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Great to see you again. Yeah, I mean, it's been a while since uh, since we met in Vegas. What was that like? That was earlier, I think, March, right? Yeah. Um, about then, and then, yeah, being out there um, in the studio with Dave was awesome. And uh, I got to try your sandwiches. Like, as soon as I rolled up to uh, the studio, you had, like, a few trays out of the sandwiches, and it was like the first thing I ate that day. So it was amazing. <laughs> well, thanks. So, yeah, sandwiches get me in everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I know you're like the guy for sandwiches. And you like bringing them to like the places with you as like a, a gift and or just like party favors and stuff. So for me, my, my best work days are when I get to personally feed people. And specifically yeah. at events uh, like today. I love that. Opening another store, and it's going to be one of my favorite days to work of the week. Yeah, yeah. so we're in Austin. You're opening up your fifth location here, yes. which is awesome. Congrats. Um, so how did you go about like picking Austin as one of your like new, I guess, bigger cities with multiple locations? Well, so initially what brought Ikes to Texas was a friend of mine, Mark Appel. We met at Stanford, the second – Ever Ikes was at Stanford, and so I met a lot of folks. When he got drafted number one overall by the Houston Astros, and he basically sent me a text saying, how can I get my favorite restaurant to Texas? And so he brought Ikes to Houston, and he's a, he's a partner in all the Austin stores too. So we got to thank him. And not that there's anything wrong with Texas itself. It's just where we're at. Uh, we really need somebody to want to, to make the effort to, hey, we're bringing Ikes to Texas, we're bringing Ikes to Houston, we're bringing Ikes to Austin. Yeah. Otherwise, there's, we have the whole, we have got 44 more states to go. We got the whole U.S. as a canvas. So somebody really needs to take the initiative and bring it. Uh, obviously, Austin's a great city. A lot of Californians here, which helps the brand. So we have to do less, a little bit less marketing, or at yeah. least people are, are word of mouthing it really, really, really quickly, which yeah. is why I was able to expand We've only been here like three or four years, and we've already got five locations. Yeah. But that's why we ended up in Austin is, thank Mark Capel. If you like Ike's <laughs> and you're in Texas, thank him. Mark's the guy. All yeah. right. Yeah, because I know a bunch of my friends, like, they love Ike's. They're from the Bay Area. They're absolutely obsessed with it. And it's like, I've we've had it multiple times since, uh, like, I've been in Austin. And it's I'll, I'll send you a pic when I'm at, like, a location yeah. and stuff. And I'm like, dude, I'm at Ike's. Um, so I know you have a bunch of, like, name sandwiches. And I know you have, like, a lot of, like, an, uh, M MLB players and stuff like that, name the sandwiches. So walk me through how you, like, got the idea to, like, name your sandwiches that way. And then you have a bunch of different options. I think you have the – most variety of sandwiches and options I've ever seen. And you have off the menu items and stuff. So how did you go about doing all of that? It kind, all that stuff kind of came as an accident. Yeah. Some was, was by choice. When I originally made the first Ike's menu, 2006, it took me about a year working on this project before yeah. it became a real thing. Mostly wow. due to, I didn't want to take the the step or I was, it was risky to quit yeah. my jobs. I had three jobs at the time. Wow. And uh, so when I made the menu, I thought when I walk into other restaurants just or sandwich places to see turkey, avocado, cheese as the option, I thought that was lame. In fact, when I look at other menus and it just says, you know, steak, 
whatever barbecue onion rings or something like that. Well, that sounds delicious. Hey, yeah, can I get the steak, onions, and barbecue sandwich? Like, I just right. thought that that was not. It was just not me. Maybe it is cool, but it's definitely not me. So I, I had my menu, and I thought to myself, I'm going to name my sandwiches. And so I first thought to, oh, I'll name them after things that inspired me or, like, inside jokes, I guess, yeah. <laughs> so to speak. And But before that, I was like, oh, you know what? I think it would be cool to, like, the inside joke part, kind of yeah. not make fun of my friends, but bring yeah. them into it. And in fact, I initially thought, oh man, I wonder when my brother's going to see this or my sister. Yeah. And so I started with naming them after my friends and family. Uh, and nice. likely, like I was, I was, I'm still kind of crumudgeon or, or whatever. I'm, I was kind of an asshole. So I, I was like, oh man, after about 14 sandwiches or so, I ran out of friends well, I ran out of friends that I felt worthy enough to get a sandwich named right. after them. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and the 14th one was my cat, so he didn't even kind of count as nice. a friend. I mean, I know cats count, but, like, it wasn't, like, a human friend. Yeah. So, for, and but my menu was 25, 26 deep, and wow. my veggie menu was 10 deep. So I was like, I need 15 more or so na- No, I need, like, 20-something more names. So that's when I started getting in the, the local. I'm from San Francisco, born and raised. Uh, who inspired me? So then I named a Montana sandwich or a rice sand- Jerry Rice sandwich, Barry Bond, all these things. Yeah. And kind of that's how things got started because I named one about the street that we were on. I named one about my high school or my elementary school, all San Francisco themed and neighborhood themed things. And what ended up, like, like I said, it was kind of an accident. What happened is when we got really actually famous lines out the door three hour waits like wow we're, we're like the franklin yeah. but of, of san francisco yeah. and people waiting in line is famous people would come in and be like oh so and so has the sandwich named after them how do i get one named right. after me so in fact if i didn't do that in the beginning kind of make people like oh who's elvis keith and who's this person right then actual celebrities wouldn't have been wouldn't even think to be asking. And then that's we we started really taking off. We got Tim Lincecum coming to design a sandwich, Matt Cain, yeah. uh, Robin Williams. And then it just kind of, now it's like I, we have a waiting list of <laughs> celebrities waiting to get their sandwiches released at this point. That's awesome. And how many how many sandwiches do you have now? Just about 1,000. It that's might be 1,000. I'd have to go back and, and count them. But we're, we're approaching 1,000. We've got wow. more vegan sandwiches than actual vegan restaurants do. We have close to 700 vegetarian sandwiches. In wow. fact, we have more vegetarian sandwiches than meat sandwiches. Wow. Mainly because we can just substitute vegetarian stuff for the meat sandwiches, but you right. can't really do, do the opposite. The opposite. Yeah. So we actually have more vegetarian sandwiches, although we have 500 or so meat sandwiches. Wow. Wow. That's and then we got gluten-free, dairy-free. It was yeah. one of those where I wanted I wanted you to walk in and then get a sam- get the best sandwich in the world, which is why our vegan menu is so huge and our vegetarian menu is so huge, and even the gluten-free. When I first even learned about that, and I kind of didn't even know about veganism that much, yeah. you come in and like, oh, I've got celiac or, or I'm allergic. I'm like, wait, what? That's a thing? That's my first thought. Yeah. My second thought was, oh, well, then how do you – like what do you eat? Right. And that was really me just being curious at the register. I yeah. used to be the only person working there. So you'd walk in and go, I'm going to get a salad because I can't eat bread. Tell me about that. Right. Where do you get your bread from? Do you, mm. What do you do? And some people were like, oh, I go to Trader Joe's or I go to this local gluten-free place. And yeah. I remember the first person that told me about gluten-free. Yeah. Um, she told me that. And I was like, oh, you know what? Okay, tonight I'm going to go to Trader Joe's and get this bread. And... So the next time you come in, I will 100% be able to make you a sandwich. Now, I literally never saw her again from that day. <laughs> but because of her right. and her telling me about that, the next time somebody actually came in and they, and they wanted a salad and, and I talked to them and they wanted to do gluten-free instead, I was like, oh, no, I got you. Right. And that kind of was the – well, that's why we're love and sandwiches. It's yeah. I want to make sure that you feel loved, respected, appreciated, and then I want to give you a delicious sandwich too. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I think you guys have, I mean, your bread is amazing. I, I prefer the, the the regular bread. Same. The famous bread. But, yeah. like, 
you know, that's really cool. I, I think you're, you had to be probably one of the first, like, sandwich places to offer gluten-free. I don't even think a I was lot of a them even now. Documentary, like, uh, yeah. I was in a documentary called Gluten-Free for You and Me wow. because they were, like, I'm not going to say I invented gluten-free sandwiches. I'm sure somebody else did, but we're yeah. the ones that made it mainstream. Right. I didn't invent vegan sandwiches, but I'm the one that made it mainstream at a yeah. non-vegan restaurant. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Where do you see that? Are you seeing like that trend continue? Are you seeing like sales from like vegan and meat? Are they comparable or is vegan continuing to grow? How are you seeing that, that trend? Well, so vegetarian, vegan, we'll, we'll put them in the same category, uh, so to speak. It's about a th- yeah. thir- maybe a little bit like 36% of sales. It's not, okay. it's not as much as, as meat goes. Though what we find chunk. is if you, it is a big chunk is if you look at what's being spoken about on the internet, mm. it's like 70% wow. when people talk about Ike's, they're talking about the vegetarian and vegan options. Mm. And in the beginning, Ike's was so popular with the vegetarian and vegan crowd right. that we were actually miscategorized on Yelp. This is like 2008, 2009 when Yelp was the place to go for food. Yeah. We were miscategorized as a vegan and vegetarian wow. restaurant. And to the, to the extent where people would call me or call Ike's yeah, yeah. and go, do you guys sell meat? Like, do you that's guys like crazy. Pe- that's how much people wow. were talking about Ike's and vegetarian and wow. veganism. In fact, when we first opened in Austin a couple of years ago, our sales were seventy percent vegetarian, vegan. Wow! Because those folks are the ones that talk about it. And, right. And, you know, it, still, even in twenty twenties, it yeah. wasn't as mainstream for places to have a vast amount of vegetarian and vegan options. Right. And so even then, we it was special. Right. Hey, go eat at Ike's. Right. And now we're we're, we're more meat sandwiches than vegan sandwiches. But it right. took like two years in Austin for us to go from a vegetarian majority to meat majority wow. to be on par with with the the rest of the stuff. That's wild. So this is why also vegetarians yeah. and vegans get a lot of sandwiches at Ike's. Yeah. Is they talk the most. Right. So I love I love vegetarians, I love vegans. Yeah. And I'm gonna continuously pump out great vegetarian vegan food. Right. Uh, one I'm it's like an extension. You get what you give back. Hey, 100%. vegetarians never talked about me. Right. And vegans never talked about me and we weren't selling them. Obviously right. we wouldn't have five hundred right vegetarian options yeah but because they show the love it's really easy for me to be like oh here's a new one here's a new right. one yeah i think listening to your customers is like it's like our customers love the vegan options that makes us unique too there's not that many other sandwich big sandwich places that offer a lot of vegan options so heck there's not even vegetarian places that right. offer it's crazy what we offer, yeah. yeah that's wild do you require your uh, employees to know all thousand sandwiches, sandwich options? <laughs> we used to uh, have this test to even be on the register, though, with like 1,400 people working yeah. and the, the like. It's kind of more difficult. And, you know, there's also the pushback of, uh, and maybe we can get into uh, some principles about success. Yeah. But it seems like there's less people willing to do more than yeah. what they're the bare minimum these right. days. So where before it'd be like, okay, you need to know 100 sandwiches before you even start. Um, and now there's kind of some laws against that yeah. too in California where yeah. uh, even though you might need a degree to work somewhere, but that's, that's totally fine, but you don't need to know some, somebody's product before you sell it, is that it's in the computer. So it's yeah. also the 2020s, they could just go to the computer and if they don't know what's on a – uh, annexation of Puerto Rico, they can just t- type that, you know, annex, and then be like, oh, this is what's on it. Right. Versus they need to memorize it. Yeah. But obviously, if they know the sandwiches, their experience is going to be better. The, the fans' experience is going to be better, and the sandwich will probably come out better, too. Yeah, for sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. So, Ike's love and sandwiches. Well, how'd you, obviously, you're Ike, but yes. why, why love and sandwiches? So I was talking with my buddy yesterday. He was like, well, why'd you name it after yourself? You're full of yourself or whatever. <laughs> now, I remember, so when, when we, when we I, was the one work, I was the only one that worked there. I still use the word we. When Ike's was uh, in the process of being created, 2006 to 2007, I knew uh, uh, that one of the last things I came to is, oh, what should I name it? And back then, MySpace was the thing. So I had a huge MySpace following, huge for whatever MySpace was. <laughs> And I just kind of posted in the little blog post, I think is what they had. Yeah. Hey, I'm looking to... Like on your wall. Uh, yeah, on my wall. Yeah, on my wall. Whatever <laughs> it was called. So I'd, I'd just go, hey, 
um, opening up a, a cafe. It was Ike's initial idea for Ike's was a cafe, wow. not a sandwich shop, but where sandwiches were the main food. Okay. But we sold, we had a full espresso bar. We had ice cream sundaes and milkshakes and salads and breakfast too. Wow. And I kind of was like, hey, I want to name, I'm, I'm opening a thing. I wanted a cool name. I couldn't think of a cool name. So I want your thoughts. And I specifically wrote in there, I don't want to name it after myself. I want it to be, <laughs> like, I don't know what the name would have been that would have been cool, but I was right. looking for a cool, catchy name to name a, a business after. Yeah. So obviously I shouldn't have said don't name it after me because like 95% of the <laughs> of the submissions were Ike's this and Ike's that and right. Ike's Cream Shop and Ike's and blah, blah, blah and, and all these things. So... I went back and said, hey, thanks for the suggestions. Really don't want Ike in the name. Yeah. Uh, turns out, well, Ike ended up being in the name because nobody yeah. nobody could come up. Uh, the, the overwhelming thing was, hey, Ike, you're a cool person. You should just name it after yourself. Yeah. So Ike's, the original name, and I still have the business cards that say it, was, was Ike's. And then it said, good-looking sandwiches, <laughs> great-tasting people. Uh, so I got this, this famous... <laughs> A mural uh, person. Uh, for those that are familiar with San Francisco, if you go on Hate Street, they have that one home or business that has the legs, the huge legs sticking out of it. If you're out there, you know what you're talking about. He designed the first Ike's logo and Ike's sign. So I sent him here. This is the name, and and he comes back to me and says, "Dude, that's you can't. That's not even going to be aesthetically. He can't make. He's like, it's I can't make an art art thing <laughs> yeah. out of that." He said, like, you can have that as your tagline, but I'm not making a sign. So he's, right. he basically said, let me, let me come up with some ideas and pitch it to you. So he came with some ideas, and it ended up being Ike's and then a sandwich and then place. Uh, we weren't a sandwich uh, place strictly, so, uh, but that was the kind of thing. He said, like, you're going to see Ike's, you're going to see the sandwich. Go, you sell sandwiches and then place because just to even out the right. Ike's on the other side. Now, that morphed into four years into Ike's Love and Sandwiches, uh, one, because there was a, a lawsuit between the city and Ike's. And so the first Ike's actually went, the company went bankrupt and uh, whatever. And this is maybe a testament that people can take away whatever it is that you have, your physical property, your money even, but they can't take away your ideas or your passion or your creativity. That right. can never be lost from you. So mm. even though the first Ike's, went out, out of business and right. went, went bankrupt. The idea then was, well, let's restart. But as I was becoming famous and being interviewed by, uh, I got interviewed by New York Times multiple times, Wall Street Journal, Fox, local news, uh, Business Week, News Week, like all these things because of a big lawsuit between Ike's and the city and yeah. Ike's and neighbors for being too popular and amongst other things. Wow. Is that... They're like, how are you causing such a commotion? 400 square feet. Like, the first Ike's was just a little bit larger than this room. Wow. Uh, serving 3 million uh, or 1,000 uh, people a day, 1,200 people a day on, on the busy weekend. Wow. Why? And there's San Francisco. There's 3,000 sandwich shops. And I said, well, because we love people more. We ca I love sandwiches more. I love food more. I love you more. I care about you. And so that's when the title got changed to Ike's and then Love because it comes before sandwiches and then sandwiches. Mm. And then I put my face as the logo, which it is now, because frankly, I got sick and tired of people going, who's Ike? Who's Ike? Like, we'd be busy lining out the door. <laughs> it's like, who's Ike? So I just put my face up there. So now people don't ask, who's Ike? They might right. ask me, hey, are you Ike? But nobody's going around thinking the person at the register is Ike or the person in the back is Ike. Or the per right, right, it's right. It's more like, stop asking me who's Ike. I have a line out the door. <laughs> Uh, like do some research, right. just g Google image search. Right, but, right. So we put my face on there. And literally once we changed the name and the logo, yeah. overnight every location went up by 25%. Overnight. Wow. Uh, and I it, I think we anthropomorphize things in general. Mm. And so when we did that with the business, I feel like it made the business something more relatable to. Interesting. And... It also helped that uh, there was a, like literally a face of the franchise. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Now, how did you get like? How was your first location so successful? Like, how did you go from like picking the location 
to getting your first couple of customers, getting the word out about it, and then just like creating this buzz that like ended up ending up getting you in a lawsuit and so much success like from just one location out of nowhere without ever starting a sandwich shop or anything before? Uh, the easy answer is tr- trial and error. Okay. What in the beginning? So the first day I didn't sell anything. People can Google that story all they want. I've told them many times. I didn't sell anything on the first day. Uh, in fact, so terribly, my day was so terrible that I, I was depressed enough or whatever you want to call it that I didn't reopen. So I opened on Halloween, and I didn't reopen until November 7th, like a full week later. Wow. And I decided when I reopened, I need to do everything differently than whatever I did on the first day. Mm. So first it comes from the premise, and it's one of the things I live by now, is if what you're doing is not working, try literally anything else. Yeah. And so the second day, um, and we were in San Francisco in the Castro, and I'm a, I was a good-looking guy, still a good-looking guy, and built. So I was like, all right, I'm going to look good as hell, and I'm, and I'm going to do something different. I'm going to stand outside of this restaurant. And I, I was also naive. I was like, oh, I'm just going to stand in here and open on Halloween, and people are just going to walk in and be like, yes, sell me food. <laughs> that didn't – spoiler alert, that doesn't work. Uh, and yeah. I was naive and thought that that would. So second day on November 7th, I stood outside. I wore, like, a nice form-fitting shirt. I looked hella good. <laughs> and everybody that walked by was like, hey, how are you doing? Hey, how are you? And people would, some people would be like, whatever, it's San Francisco. And it was a busy street. Some people right. ignored me. Right. And so be like, hey, how are you doing? And would wave back. And anybody that responded, I would offer to buy them a sandwich. Wow. Like, hey, all right, let me buy you lunch. I just opened, and I haven't made any sandwiches yet, so I'd like to make one. Because uh, they'd be like, "Why would you want to buy me a sandwich?" And I'd say, "Well, I haven't sold anything yet, and I want right. to, and I need to. Pr- I can't right. not make zero sandwiches right. on the second day, yeah. so I'm at least going to make them even if they're free." And and so I, on the second day, I got nine people to walk in. No, no, none of them actually let me buy them sandwiches. In fact, when I refused to take their money, they would just leave a ten dollar bill or a twenty dollar bill in the tip jar. So wow. in fact, I made way more money trying to be generous than I would have That's had so I was just trying yeah. to sell, sell sandwiches. Yeah. So on the, on the second day, I sold nine sandwiches. Nice. So stunningly, it took me three days of being open to even get to double digit sandwich sales, and. It was is a combination of well one who's gonna be like all right I'm gonna go outside and and talk to every single person right. and then who's gonna offer free food and and because I didn't open up Ikes to make money I opened up Ikes because I was stuck in working for other people and I thought if I was gonna be not financially uh, secure then why work, why do that for someone else when I can be non financially se- secure and then do it for myself yep. And so I was thinking, hell, I'm opening up a sandwich place. Yeah, sure, I want it to make money, and I don't want to go out of business, and yeah. and I'd love to have a good livelihood from there. But I didn't open up Ike's to make money. I opened up Ike's to feed people, to eat, and to create like a food kind of – for me, food is one of my top values. Hmm. Heck, the, the society, we – hey, let's meet up and go for – like we yeah. just hang out with people over meals all the time, so it's not – unique to me and then over time when i couldn't stand outside because i was standing outside and then maybe we'd have a few people in there yeah. i was like well what can i do to get more business almost every moment of me the first several weeks of ikes yeah. was about because then it was like 200 dollars a day which was roughly like 30 or so sandwiches good enough to not go out of business but not good enough to to live a life where I wasn't working every right. single hour of the day. And I started thinking, okay, well, what are other things I can do? Mm. And so I hired some, one of my really good friends, known him since he, we were nine years old. Uh, his girlfriend was, uh, his girlfriend's sister was looking for a work and I was like, hey, I can, yeah, she's charming and cute. I'll have her come in and give her some, some coupons and have her, instead of just me standing outside, I'm gonna have her, but her go on a different corner. Right. And then that turned into multiple, charming people 
that were looking for work to stand on multiple corners and I'd give them each different color flyers and I had like a game who could get the most people and then that person would get a, a prize ah. um, usually a money prize because people like to play for money of course and <laughs> I basically did that and had other unique ideas like okay we're gonna do this we're gonna play a game we're gonna we're gonna extend this out until I no longer needed to do that I'd, yeah. I'd have you and a few other charming people uh, around in the street team basically and then I, I just, if I need help, I'll call you. Right. And then it, it basically did stuff like that, talking to people, outwardly focused, offering people free stuff yep. until we no longer needed to do that. Now, we still right. give away free stuff, yeah. but I don't have, don't have that many people standing on the street yeah. uh, attempting to get business in. Yeah, I love that. I think, I mean, I think it's important, I mean, providing value first Right. When I started doing events, like they're free events, I covered all the costs myself. I bought like drinks and food for everyone. Do you know what I mean? So I think when you make people feel welcome and that, you know, it's like you're doing it just because you want to do it and you want them to be happy and like you want them to feel good, I think that's where if you're not doing it just for the money, like you said, it separates you from every other business that is just doing it for the money. You know what I mean? And I think that that's, um, that's a really great story, man. So you mentioned that you were working three jobs before. Yeah. Um, you also, we were talking earlier about you being a professional poker player. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about what, like, what were you doing before Ike's? Fill me in on like, all the jobs, you know, what was the professional poker about? How long were you doing that before you really wanted to actually just open up your own store? Right. Let's see. So I have a long entrepreneurial history okay. and all unsuccessful ones for, for the way that we would measure uh, financial yeah. success and growth success. And uh, Though I learned a lot from those. I've been selling – Baseball cards since eight, and selling candy at school, and packs of <laughs> packs of sports cards. Yeah. Uh, in fact, my nickname when I was a kid from older, like the teachers and the coaches, were they used to call me Horse Trader Ike because I was <laughs> I was out there hustling. Or if I saw something, it's like, oh, I got this Michael Jordan card, and I'm trying to sell it for twenty five dollars, and I know yeah. a guy can buy them for fifteen dollars uh, from uh, like I. I basically broker relationships. Nice. So I know you love Michael Jordan. Who do you like? Charles Barkley? All right. I can get you this Charles Barkley card for $10, knowing I can go get it for like seven right. and middleman these kind of deals and then candy and, and other things like that. So <laughs> that was probably my, my junior, not my elementary, junior high, high school thing. Oh, I went to college and got kicked out pretty quickly like before the end of my sophomore Where did you year. go? I went to UC Davis okay. and I got essentially kicked out for not trying to graduate. Um, I was, <laughs> I, I learned in college, actually my grades are better when I'm taking classes that I wanted to mm. take versus mm -hmm. have to right. take. And yep. so I was taking classes like, I was really into accounting or, or wanting to learn about accounting. So I took accounting, got an A in it because I really wanted to learn how that stuff worked. I took drama, got an A in it, obviously because I liked it. I took uh, cooking or what, I don't know what it was called, but like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And creative writing, uh, which I didn't get a good grade in creative writing actually. So I'm not sure the teacher, I don't know. I liked it, but apparently not good enough to get a good grade in it. And so I was yeah. studying computer science and engineering in okay. And to nice. be fair to my uh, counselors, they did email me several times, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Hey, we're going to kick you out. Hey, and then I just was like, whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and and so I ended up going into business with the, in the family business, which was a supermarket. Okay. Slash, uh, it was more like a, a larger 7-Eleven type thing, but it wasn't, it wasn't called 7 obviously it wasn't a 7-Eleven, but a larger type of that kind of thing, but with a liquor and, and beer and there was a meat market in there. A so like a, like a, it was like a deli. convenience store, but, but like more so because it had a meat market in there That's and it cool. was a local, it was in 16th and Mission. The business still is, is in existence. It's not called, um, it's not mine anymore and, and it's not anybody I knows anymore and they changed the name. Of it. It's more like a Mexican market with, with a meat market in there. Okay. And so I had that and 
ended up being really successful. I got a, had a house, had a car, a 1975 Stingray. Loved, loved it. It was fast. Uh, geez, it was very light and very fast. And I had a home a duplex in San Francisco. And this was like early, uh, this is late 90s, uh, early 2000s. So, I mean, sh- and, but anyway, the business ended up slowly over a three-year period going down, starting with around 9-11 and uh, the economy there. Uh, and I'm in Middle Eastern, for those of you that know. So, so I, and surprisingly, in San Francisco, a very liberal, liberal city, there were people that were actually really upset at mm. uh, Arabs and Muslims back then. And I'm not saying that's the reason why I went out of business, yeah. but it was very surprising how much hate that, that there was there. But anyway, starting then, the business and maybe the economy, too, was going, and I ended up having to sell my house because I wanted to save the business, sold my car to pay wow. rent, and ended up going out of business April... 11th, 2004, like closed. Uh, I was working 20 hours a day for probably 20 bucks, barely. Uh, couldn't pay this, can pay the light bills can, and all that stuff. So I closed the store and then immediately went into a depression. Like I suck, I'm a failure. I went from making 300,000 or so a year to can't, like now I'm living in the back of a, I was living in the supermarket in the back with no power, eating the canned goods on the shelf and luckily I, I didn't I didn't like starve because I had a supermarket and right. I had a couple thousand dollars worth of groceries right. um, all the non-perishables I was eating cereal without the milk uh, canned soups and things like that wow. unfortunately I didn't have power so it was like cold but hey it's not starving right yeah uh, after about a couple months of that I got evicted from the business the landlord evicted rightfully so I wasn't paying right. rent but I was living there until I couldn't live there anymore and then I kind of wandered uh, food insecure, living on like $100 a month in food and relying on on friends for support or couches, slept in the back of other people's businesses, wow. slept in a van um, several times, several nights, and also kind of not sharing my exp- experience. I'm sure if I went to my loved ones like, hey, I'm starving, uh, feed me, then right. I would have got fed for sure. But there was a lot of me pretending that things were okay. Mm. And so I was living on like a hundred dollars a day in food, uh, and sleeping on little floors. Uh, so it's basically like a crappy version of camping. <laughs> yeah. But urban, and I laugh about it now because for a hundred percent, my experience there, and we'll get to it when when Ike's comes, it, is that it allowed me to experience life at a level at a level so low that there's not really a reason to not think about doing what you want instead. Yeah. Because, let's say, say Ike's had failed, which it did. Remember, the first one went out of business. If I wasn't me and learned all these things, I, uh, if I knew, I was like, okay, well, I can, I can't, I can live off of $100 a month. Right. Then I might not have taken the risk. And, in right. fact, when people ask, oh, why would you take the risk? Well, it wasn't a risk to me. I've already yeah. been hundred dollars a month, so anything better than that is not a risk. Yeah. Uh, so I did that, and that was a, a it was about nine months before I recovered my mental um, and and like physical, phys- like the whole beingness to sure. to actually uh, move towards a, a positive direction. Yeah. And so I started playing poker. I had I was like, oh, there's this tournament. It's forty dollars to enter. I really was into the whole poker craze. And I was, I was thinking, hmm, well, 40 bucks, well, what, I can either eat, and I was eating a lot of dollar menu from McDonald's and Jack in the Box. God bless them, Taco Bell, for, for having such an inexpensive menu, which now it's not as inexpensive. Right. Uh, so I was eating a lot of two for 99 cent tacos at Jack in the Box and dollar menu from McDonald's at Burger King, all those places. So thank you for that, guys out there, for having that. It was really useful for me. And I was like, well, for $40, like, it was a lot of food. Obviously, it's like 80 tacos or something yeah. like that, give or take. And I decided to, to take a risk. I was like, I I'm, I'm, would play house games for not for money or for really cheap buy-ins, like $5. So I entered for $40 in this tournament in the Bay Area and I, at, at uh, Artichoke Joe's, and I won the tournament. And that basically bankrolled my whole entire professional poker career. And I just started playing tournaments. Uh, 
I shied away from cash games when I saw that actually cash games you could you could get destroyed if if your bankroll is really low like mine was in the beginning it could get destroyed but in a tournament one hand isn't even if I lose a big hand it's not gonna destroy me and so I started playing a style of poker for tournaments that would make it so that I would get in the money I made eight final I would make eighty percent of the final tables wow. of the tournaments that I entered in. So much so that they started calling me final table. Be like, oh, there's another final table. There's another final, final table. table like. they, they, just <laughs> just, they were just like, oh, it's final table. It's final table. And uh, now what happened is, so I grew up uh, Arab and Muslim. I grew, grew up that. So once my family was like, oh, wait, you're gambling for a living? And I wanted to explain uh, it's not yeah. really gambling. Right, right. It's a tournament, right. so it is skill and all that stuff. And I go, I did pay $40, and I'm technically, not even technically, I was like, I'm not gambling. I paid $40, and I'm right. up like 7000 yeah. so it's not gambling. Yeah. It's it's uh, you know, it's only gambling if you're going to lose. And, yeah, I didn't win 100% of the time. But I find, like, 80%, you would consider that not gambling, right? At, at some point, if you were 80% on, yeah. your, on your gambling, it's it's something other than chance. Sure. It's either skill or, or it could be luck, too, for sure. Get, poker's a I still think poker is like 90% luck. If you don't get the cards, you don't get the cards. Uh, it might be a little bit less if you're really good, like maybe 75% luck, but still. Sure. But, but I had a way to, okay, I'm going to get to the final table. So, so basically, my family thought I had a gambling problem. And to prove that I didn't have a gambling problem, I was like, fine, I'll just quit cold turkey. So I basically quit wow. uh, playing poker as my means to make money. And it was like 95% of my income back then. And so I thought, well, okay, well, what can I do for for um, income instead? I had, a, I had a good amount saved up from poker. And I thought, if I had a dream world, what would I do? And I was like, oh, I'd sell – I made a list, actually, and this is something that everybody listening can do. Mm. I made a list of what was important to me at the time. And literally, and this is 2004, number one on the list was getting dates. Like my number one thing, I was like 20 – how old was I? Like 24, 25? I was like, no, I want dates. And number two thing was I want to make sure I'm, I'm eating food and not, not food insecure. And – uh, I like hanging out with people. I like animals. I love eating. And like I just made this list of, of some things. Yeah. So it was like 17 or 18 things of that I love to do. Yep. And I was like, oh, wait, okay. What's a job that I can get like women at? And so I f- first thought maybe I'd be a dating coach or writing dating books. So, uh, But I was like, ah, that seems like not a realistic way to make money. And I was walking uh, close by to um, where I was living, and I saw a women's clothing store. I was like, oh, man, all the girls that work here are hot. All the, <laughs> all the, uh, most of the customers are hot. I was like, oh, I should work here. So, and it was the holiday season. Yeah. It was the end of the year 2004. And, I'm, and right before Thanksgiving, like right around, and I was, I was just thinking to myself, oh, I walk in there. I'm like, hey, I know you guys are hiring for the holidays. I'll work here uh, minimum wage. Like, because I wasn't doing it for the money. I was doing right, it because right. I wanted to, to get dates. So it was a place called BB. Uh, and I don't think they exist in a brick and mortar sense. But they definitely, uh, and they were like, no, sorry, we're not hiring. And I'm like, this is bull crap. They're not hiring me because I'm a dude. Right. Uh, it's the holidays. You're definitely hiring. But they yeah. told me to go go to the mall. <laughs> so I went to the mall and asked the same thing. They said, no, we're not hiring. And I'm thinking again, this is bull crap. Yeah. But I noticed when I was there, I looked upstairs and I was like, oh, Victoria's Secret. And I was thinking, whoa, 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 that's a much better idea than working at BB. <laughs> so I go up there and, hey, hey, look, you have they had a now hiring sign. So I was like, hey, I will work here. And they're like, well, we don't know. I go, I'll work for minimum wage. Uh, how about this? And I made them a deal. I was like, hire me minimum wage and you can fire me January, whatever, 15th or whenever the return season's over. Like, yeah. I will work here and I'll voluntarily walk away in right after the holiday season. If I don't do it, good, I'll leave. And but by then they so they they hired me they took a chance I was working for eight dollars an hour and and then they basically promoted me <laughs> for like three months. <laughs> now I was I was, I was uh, one of their um, leads at the store at the time, and so I worked there for a while. Victoria's uh, Secret. So I was working at Victoria's Secret. Oh my god! I started getting into real estate. Unfortunately, okay. it was two thousand six, two thousand seven at the time. So it was a terrible time to get in real estate. I'd have things in in escrow, and then the bank was like, "No, sorry, we're not going to give you the money." And that ended up turning into a lot of work for literally zero money. Uh, those of you that are have worked in real estate know it's you're showing, you're driving around, and, and you work on commission 100%, basically. Yeah, no, for me, it was 100%. And so I started thinking about how to um, 
be creative and, and make money, even though banks aren't lending at this time. Right. So I started doing leases for businesses, mm. leases for people looking for apartments. And, and even though it was way less, I say maybe I make $1,000 on a lease versus $70,000 selling a property in California. Um, but what happened is I was helping a woman find a cafe. She wanted a cafe and, and showing her around, that ended up where I got the idea of like, oh, I should open up a cafe. Is <laughs> because the economy was so bad I couldn't sell real estate that I had to pivot to leases. Mm. And I was like, oh, you know what? That location that I showed her was really, I loved the part of the city. And the first, that location ended up becoming the first Ikes. Wow. And so those are the kind of the jobs I was doing That's right so before funny. Ikes. And I, my, a buddy of mine, my roommate at the time, his father opened up a restaurant. And I thought, well, if I'm going to open up a restaurant, I should probably work at a restaurant. I've never worked at one in my life. And so I worked there, and, and he put me as a bartender, which was not my forte because I didn't drink, and I didn't drink for sure back then. And I have one worst bartender in Palo Alto. But basically, that was me right before Ike's. That's wild. And then so you you get the location. You're like, this location would be awesome. Yeah. For, and, and then how did you go about, like, okay, sourcing – the the products like picking the menu doing all of that like did you just learn it did you ask someone for help how did you get like going as like you know a sandwich shop oh man so <laughs> for me it's a lot for for me I went back to a li- like when I made the list to work at yep. Victoria's Secret and BB yep. and and, the, oh, and and by the way spoiler alert or not spoiler alert I ended up working at BB too I did such a great job at Victoria's Secret no way that the manager comes up there and be like would you like to work for us too the next holiday season That's and I, was, I told her I was like you guys rejected me I would have been working down there right. so this is a testament to if you're if you're gonna be uh, in whatever you're gonna do working do more than what you're paid for because then you're gonna get promoted I was knew I was gonna be gone in January. Uh, but I went out there and, I, and like I don't wear bras. Obviously, the only my only experience with bras and panties is is seeing them on on people that I've dated. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I don't know anything about this. So I started asking my my um, friend, my female friends, and even my my have five sisters. I'm like, hey, uh, you wear this bra. Why do you wear this bra for? And I started learning about bras and and knowing like, oh, you wear this because when you're running it does this, or you wear this because it helps you with a strapless or whatever. Like I didn't know anything about bras, and then. Like three months in, I was like a bra expert, <laughs> like for sure. I'd be like, "Oh, I see your strap. Oh, you can use this." And that most people aren't going to go in there and, and do that kind of research, right, right, right. Because it's just a normal it, job. It's, it's like, oh, whatever. I'm just going to do the mere minimum. Right. For me, I was like, well, if I'm going to sell bras, I'm going to be the best bra salesman, like bra <laughs> specialist is what they called it. I want to be like the best. Yeah. And I ended up winning Angel of the Year. The VP of the company sent me a letter no for, for breaking a record. And then the uh, same thing, w- w- and then it gets recognized. So you might not get paid by Victoria's Secret, or the job that I had, even though they did double my pay to become a lead. But then I ended up getting a better job uh, or more paying, higher paying job from BB because I was doing more than what I was getting paid for. And they're like, we need this person. So it's a testament to whatever you're doing right now, do more than what you're willing to be, than what you're actually getting paid for. And if they're not going to pay you, somebody's going to come around and be like, you should be my assistant. Like billionaire is going to be like, all right, you're my new assistant or whatever. You're going to move up some, you're going to be paid by somebody for what you put in no matter 100%. what. It always works out. Yeah, uh, d- totally. And then so, well, actually, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> um, we were talking about, <laughs> dude, honestly, what, were, what was the original question? So we were talking. Oh, well, yeah, so I made the list. You were asking did, me about, yeah, about yeah, what yeah. to do. So <laughs> what, what, when I wanted to get into business for myself, I yeah. went back to, let me make a list. Right, right, right. And so I made a list, and this time, uh, being more self-aware about myself, but yeah. I will say I was a freaking cynic. I wanted to open up my own business because I hated yeah. working for other people, yeah. even though I loved the clients at Victoria's yeah. Secret and at BB and, and real estate. I was like, F Victoria's Secret, F BB, F I was working for Remax, F my, and even my my uh, friend, my roommate's bo- father, who was my boss, like F that guy too. I'm going to go and do my own. So it was from a space of, 
dude, working for like I've been there. I I think right. that working for other people is one of the worst things a human being can do unless you're uh, totally in alignment with their values mm. and you're you're a hundred percent on board with their values. It's a waste of your life right. to do that. You're building somebody else's dream versus yeah. working on yours. Right. So like, and 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 what I wasn't even coming from that eloquent of a space. I was like f everybody. I don't know if you could swear on here, but I don't really want yeah, to swear anyway. So I was like f everybody. I'm gonna do my own thing. Yeah. And so I, again, I went to okay. If I'm gonna be insecure. Uh, if I'm going to not be happy I'd, uh, financially and feel unappreciated, I'm going to go do that for myself. So I made a list. And this time I wrote, made a list of 37 things. Wow. And I, and same thing. I still had uh, going on dates on the list was still pretty high on my list. I had eating, snuggling baby animals was on the list, uh, hanging out with friends. I mean, just made a list, 37 things. Yeah. And that list I went and and for each thing on the list, I was like, how could I make money going on dates? So. I did once upon a time have a website called Hot Date for the number four hire dot com where if you needed to make your boyfriend or girlfriend jealous, I got you um, <laughs> for a fee, obviously, and and things like so. That was one way to make money going on dates. Uh, I started writing a book on how to meet the internet dating first started. Um, coming wow. coming in, but it was still to the point where, wow, you met somebody on the internet? Did they murder you? Or right, you better? right, right. So I, I wrote a book, and I, I, the plan was to go on 100, to get 100 women to meet me off the line and pay for the first date. I was thinking, like, how wow. to be unique, and I, and I ended up getting 100 women to take me out on the first date. And, and so it was a book on that. Um, not not produced. Maybe I'll release it one day. I, I feel like I'm at the at first. I thought I was going to get canceled. Now I'm like ah, I could probably write anything now and won't get canceled. <laughs> and then, uh, but one the list was feeding people, cooking. I really started realizing I really love cooking, and then creating a a table spot. Uh, a people like a, an, an ambiance and mem- memories is probably the proper creating memories with friends through food and conversation. And it thought, talked to me, wow, I should totally open up a cafe. And so I, I go, I'm going to open up Ike's. So I'm thinking, well, I don't know how to run a restaurant. <laughs> right, right. So I made another list. Like, what do I think I need to do? I need a name. I need a location, which then check check location. Yep. I need a menu. I need product. I need all these things. What I sign. And I made a list. It was a much shorter list. It was like 12 or 13, 14, 15 things. And we have this internet thing like called Google back then. But now you pick your search engine of choice. And I just started searching uh, wholesalers near me and or wholesalers San Francisco because that's where I was, and I was like, oh, there's this wholesaler. There's this, and I just started how to create pricing, and I just literally wow. I didn't know anything, but there's no excuse to not have knowledge in 2024, 2023. Oh yeah, man. 20, the, and any of the the 20 like there's no reason for you to be like, oh, I don't know how to do it. No, you just haven't done it yet. You totally know how to do it because you can just Google it. So I searched everything, and that's how I learned to open up a restaurant. I had some experience from my previous business, and I learned a lot of things what not to do as well. Right. But I didn't wasn't able to open up Ike's because I had a previous business. I was open open up Ike's because I knew how to use the internet, and I just go okay, food cost, menu, sign yep. person. That's how I found the sign guy to make me the the first Ike sign, which is freaking right. beautiful. It was a piece of art. For sure, basically became a landmark there, and all these things, and so the, it was kind of, I want to say easy. The hardest part of the whole journey was deciding to quit my jobs, mm. deciding to actually move forward. That was, and then actually quitting my jobs and yep. moving forward. That was the hardest part. Yeah. Every single thing outside of that has been easier in starting my business. But yeah. wherever you are right now, if you're working for other people or you're unhappy with where you're at, the hardest part is going to be, okay, I'm just going to go go for it. Everything else was easy. In fact, it's been so uh, – I don't want to say – maybe easy is the wrong word. It's been so flowing in the correct direction mm. that it's it's like as if the universe was like, oh, great. You're going to actually go for your passion? Here, get it. Right. Yeah, I went through a lot of trials and tribulations, went out of business and selling anything on the first day. The first – out of the first five Ikes – Four of them no longer exist. One of them closed, open and closed three different times. The first original location is open and closed three different times. And it's now I have 120 something locations on the path to 200, 300. Like there's no stopping it now. Right. So I'm not saying it was, re- it was actually easy, 
but it flew and flowed in the perfect way, almost as if the, like I said, the magic wand in the universe yeah. is like, here you go, or For God, sure. or whatever you want to believe in. Yeah. I mean, it's there's so many things there that I want to get into. Number one, the list thing. I think anytime for me too that I'm like going through kind of like a uncertainty moment, I make a list. And I'm like, okay, what are the things that I know for sure, right? What are the things that I need to do? And making just a simple list. And the the decision to take the step, I think is the hardest. I think that is holding probably 99% of people back from doing what they actually want. It's the, uh, at the end of the day, it's really fear, right? It's, it's a combination of, I think, fear and uncertainty. And I think if people knew what to do, um, and like had, uh, someone there that they saw or that they could see that did that. Um, I think that that would help ease a lot of it for them. But I think a lot of people going back to what you were saying earlier too, and I've had this too, it's like, once you experience zero, once you experience the bottom, you're not afraid of the bottom anymore. So it's, um, I think it, it's also like Draymond, uh, John, the shark, he has like a book on the power of broke. And it's like, once you experience that, it's like, you're not afraid of anything. It's like, I've already been there. Like, I know how to get out of that now. I don't, if, if everything is taken from me, I know I can battle back from it because I've already done it. Like, I've already been there. So there's no reason that I can't do it again. I have confidence in myself to do it again. So no matter what happens, I can always come back from it. And I think a lot of people that don't experience that, um, they, they don't have the confidence in themselves. They don't understand, um, like, yes, it's risky, but it's like, is it riskier than just, you know, having an unhappy life and like unfulfilled work? To me, no. It's like I, I've always wanted to be like passionate about the things that I'm doing. And I think a lot of people, I don't know what, what your thoughts are on this too, but we can dive deeper into like what you think, like what do you think is holding the most people back from making that step and that decision to be an entrepreneur or to do the thing that they may know like deep down they should be doing, right? But aren't doing right now. First thing I think is that no one is taught mm. that going for what you would like is going to actually lead you towards the best possible life for you. We don't get taught. I, I know I didn't get taught in school, and I, and I, know, no, I for sure know that it doesn't happen, is where your values, regardless of what your values are, are the most important thing, and they're going to drive you anyway. So if you move in the direction of what you value, you're going to be a genius in that area. You're going to be creative in that area. You're not going to quit when the going gets tough because you value it very, very, very highly. Whereas if you works for somewhere, even if you're getting paid a lot of money, if it gets going gets tough, you're going to be like, oh, screw this job and leave it because it's not high on your value system. Right. And I think there's also an extent to the world or a lot of people in the world, maybe a lot of influential people in the world, There's there because there is a necessity to have drones or whatever you want to call them, worker bees, uh, because people think like, oh, I have this business and it needs people that want to live work paycheck to paycheck or think that's the only way to be. So there's a small sampling of, of it's done deliberately on purpose or, and maybe even unconsciously deliberately on purpose. Yeah. But people don't know. If, l l just look at your life right now. You're listening to this, although probably someone listening to this isn't the person that needs to hear this, is look at what you're already doing in your life and that you do it anyway even if there's no money involved. Those are the things that you value highly. And so if you're doing those things, 
you don't have to be reminded to do that, whatever that is. Like for me, it's nobody has to remind me to cook a great meal and nobody has to remind me to read and study. Mm-hmm. Nobody has to remind me to want to go and feed people. In fact, I go out and feed people and I don't make more money because I feed people. So I'm technically not getting paid for it. I get paid the same amount whether I go to this opening tonight or not. Why do I go? Because I, I enjoy it, which means I'm going to be really creative around it. Look, see my menu. I'm going to be a genius in the area, seeing in, see in how I've delegated things so that, I, that Ike's gets um, expanded in, in the most efficient way possible. So people aren't taught that. Now, I think also maybe the opposite is, is more uh, kind of how in, in the news or, or social media these days, negative things get more amplification either because well partially because we we read negative news more or we love conflict on social media more than if somebody's like hey here's 10 steps to happiness like the person that's going to watch that post and make that po- is not going to go viral yeah. uh, unless like somebody tr- and even if somebody tremendously famous did it uh, wh- whoever your a list celebrity like wh- i don't i don't know who the, who the key ones are these days but it doesn't matter fill in your favorite celebrity the most famous person you know, like if Taylor Swift went out and was like, here's 10 keys to happiness, I guarantee the uh, any other post that's not that, it will go more viral than her 10 keys to happiness post, even though she's such an influential person in society, especially uh, yeah. these days, right? So we hear the negativeness. Yeah. And that gets re- rehabilitated on the inside and, and compounded. When I was working at Victoria's Secret and BB and real estate, all I heard from my coworkers was life sucks. There weren't people. I was the happiest person working there because I genuinely wanted to, like, I was I mean, 100%. I was flirting with every single woman I was attracted to. Uh, not, I would say not in a, in a sleazy way because I got, like, 350 numbers a month or something. So, obviously, it was in a, in a way that, that was useful for both of us. And I sold the most bras and I sold the most panties and I got the more people to sign up for the credit card. Like it worked for the business and it worked for me. And I assume it worked for them too, because they were buying more bras from me. They, I would have people in the fitting room. I wasn't even helping to be like, where's the guy at? Have him come over here. And I want him to help me, even though I wasn't wow. the one helping. I hear that all the time. Ike, you're needed in the fitting room. Ike, you're needed in this, this room. Because I generally wanted to be working there versus yeah. a lot of people that, that probably weren't. Right, and you could right, apply that right. too. When I was selling, when I was uh, work, oh, I worked at Trader Joe's too. I don't think I mentioned that. When I was working at Trader Joe's, and we would have a conversation, and you would be talking to me about food. I'm like, oh my god, there's this one product, and I'd be like, no, come with me. And we'd go to the aisle. Like I'd be at the register with you, and be like, no, we're gonna go to this aisle, and I'm gonna get you this product because I think you're gonna you're gonna love it. And that was from a genuine like that was for sure food is one of my highest values. Yeah. So I was like, here, eat this. Right. And right, right. and so at Trader Joe's, they're like, wow, we really need I to work here and they they gave me a raise too but it's not because i'm a, I'm a good employee in fact I, i've definitely been the one that's milking the clock before at jobs i didn't appreciate milking the clock mm. or or wasting t- whatever you want to call it i've yeah. been the bad employee i've right. been the one that if you saw me on the schedule you're like oh shit ike is working today yeah i've been that person and i've also noticed that i'm happier when i was when i linked what i valued to working at victoria's secret working mm. at trader joe's working at in real estate what do I value out of it? And if everybody just filtered what they valued into their job right now, like today your day will be better. Right. And then tomorrow you'll end up getting paid more money, either from your employer or because somebody's going to see you doing your work and be like, oh, we're going to make you v- vice president of operations at some other, yeah. some other business. So I, I, I even think fear is not, has nothing to do with it. It's just they're framed negatively. And so they think that there's not really an option, not that they're afraid. I think fear is less so of an experience because if, if I was, whatever you do on your values, if you, you like write out what you actually do. And I said, do you have fear? I'm hanging out with your kids, say if you have kids or hanging out with your pets, if you have pets, right. do you have fear in these areas? No. So uh, make, move those values into your work and then right. you will not have fear there. And then for yeah. sure, hundred percent. It's a law of the universe. If you do more than what you're willing to be paid for and you're passionate about it because you link your values to it, yep. you're going to make more money than what you're making right now. 100%. You're, you're going to get paid in backlog. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's one of those things, too, where I've, I've been certain places and I've had waiters or bartenders or whatever, and I'm like, their energy is amazing. Like they're charismatic, whatever. And I'm like, I would hire that person like that. 
you know what I mean? And then you have the opposite effect too, where it's like you're running into situations where it's like you can tell the waiter doesn't want to be there. They don't like they're not enjoying it, right? And not just waiter, but like any like establishment you go into, right? And I think being an entrepreneur, I'm like, I'm looking at that like, okay, these are the people, like there's certain people that I would be like, yo, like, do you like work? Do you want to work somewhere else? Like, and I know that happens a lot. So it doesn't it's take for those people much. If they just quit that job 100%. and then did anything else. Right. Yeah, for sure. I think it comes back to also just like abundance versus scarcity, right? A lot of people have grown up in very rough environments, situations, circumstances where they have such a negative kind of just cloud, right, of ideas, thoughts, feelings over them for so long. And it's hard to break out of that. It takes time. And I think that it's important, right, for people to like, no matter what your, what, no matter what your situation has been in the past, that doesn't mean that that's going to continue. And um, you can break out of that with m- making that list and getting aligned with what you're talking about. If you can do that and just pick that one thing, those two things that you really, your values are aligned and then look for the opportunities around you right that can provide that because you you made the list but some people might not have saw oh all the girls are going into bb and this stuff and had the confidence to go in and ask for a job and then when they got rejected like been like ah like you know this is it but no you went to the mall (laughs) right and then you you went to victoria's secret do the same thing right and then that just started it i think a lot of people They'll give up kind of easily too um, when the first thing doesn't doesn't quite work out, um, and I think they also will you know miss out on some great opportunities just because the first thing didn't work. I think um, there's a really good saying with um, Thomas Edison with the light bulb and stuff where he tried like a thousand times and it wasn't working. They're like, why do you why did you keep trying? after a thousand times trying to make the light bulb. And he's like, I didn't, he was like, I didn't find, or it wasn't a thousand failures. I found a thousand ways it wouldn't work. So I knew I was close to getting it to work. Right. And it's like so interesting to think about that stuff. And I, I know you've gone through a lot of different like trials, experiments, struggles and stuff even before Ike's and then during Ike's too, it wasn't like obviously a cakewalk, but how do you go through, how do you go through those rough patches? Like, is it, is your first step, like the list, is that, is that what you really focus on? Are you, um, like when, when something bad happens, let's say in your business or life, whatever, uh, what's, how do you get out of those negative thoughts? How, like, what's the first thing that you do or how do you go through those, those times? So it starts with the realization that what you want is the most important thing. Mm. Anytime I'm in a debate with anybody, whether it's on social media or in real life, I'm like, hey, look, nobody's opinion is more important than yours. Mm. Nobody's. And that's the first, like, even if we're discuss, if we were in an argument, I'm like, your opinion is the, is the only opinion that should matter on the whole planet to you. Right. Um, but you just got to make sure it's actually your opinion versus a parroted opinion. And yeah. You're saying it because it's what society says right. or your religion says or your parents say or any other non ness But one of the, the list that I made multiple times in my life was a manifestation of me realizing. And, and like I said, I was a cynic. I was not into personal development at all. I didn't think like, oh, I need to grow and do all these things. It was more like actually – I'm so cynical that what actually makes me happy is this. Great, I'm going to do this. Like that's it kind of came from that. Like I hate what I'm doing, but I love this, so I'm going to do this instead. And it came from that. So if you're in the space like, "Oh, capitalism sucks," or whatever wherever you are right now, your job sucks, you hate your yeah. boss, you hate everything, use that as a, "Okay, well what do you actually like?" 
And so the list was actually a manifestation of my cynicism, of my hate mm-hmm. of what I, my experience in life. Um, my, I was despising where I was at and was also yeah. feeling like I wasn't successful and, and I'm a loser and, and all these things, all these negative things. I believe negative feelings are our friends. They're a compass that points us in the direction of where we uh, need to, should, I don't, I don't know, whatever word it is, that where, where our happiness actually lies. So if I'm really upset at my work yeah. and it's firing me up, oh, that means I should probably work on where, where I'm working. That's why it's, the negative feeling is there. And so I made this list. And what happened for me was, in fact, I ended up working seven days a week at the th- four jobs that I had. I'd work two jobs in a day sometimes, not be tired at all, because I was linking it to what makes me happy. So Victoria's Secret is is meeting women. Um, also, I love the competition of like once I was like, oh wait, we can compete for selling the most bras and and win like it wasn't really a prize, although I did get a ten dollar gift card once for for some place, <laughs> but it was more. The competition, same at BB, we're working on com- yeah. commission, and they do a list of everybody in the mm. whole district and where you placed in, in the league or whatever. And so I was like, oh, I like that. I like competition. I love making women feel empowered and beautiful. I love uh, making money on commit. So it was kind of, I was like, I'm going to work seven days a week. And my friends thought I was crazy. Why, right. why are you working seven days a week? Well, it was easy for me to work seven days a week once I linked it to what I what makes me actually happy. So in anything that you're doing right now, you can link what it is that you value. Your opinion's the only one that matters, the whole planet. Yeah. So link what you value to what you're doing right now. And when you do that, say during Ike's when it was a struggle, it's easy to keep doing it because I was doing it for these reasons. It's what would you do that nobody's paying me any for anywhere, anyway. So why would I quit when it I'm not getting paid? Like I do it. You do it already. Like, what are the things you do right now? Do you play video games? Do you talk to your friends? Do you eat? Do you go on? Whatever those things are. Do you hang out with your dog? You can't, you're like, are you going to be, your life's going to be going so bad you're not going to hang out with your dog? No, that's never going to happen. If <laughs> hanging out with your dog is on your list, right? So it just link what those things are to whatever it is that you're doing. And while it wasn't a cakewalk, during the beginning of Ike's. Heck, yeah. even now, often it's not a cakewalk. 15 years, 16 years in, it's that the reason why I'm doing it, I would, fe- like, I'm going to, I feed people for free all the time. So why am I going to complain about making money for, or if it gets a little bit tough? I'm going to do that anyway. Right. You are at my house right now. I'm hungry. So I'd probably be like, oh, let's, I'm going to make us some food. Yeah. I'd do that anyway. You're not going to be like, here's, 20 bucks, thanks for the meal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I would do that for strangers. I'd be right. at people's houses for a, for a house party and towards the end of the night be like, oh, hey, yeah, who's hungry? I'll, I'll, you guys are hungry? Let me just make something. I got some stuff. And I wouldn't know anybody in the, in the party, basically. Yeah. So that's basically how it became. I mean, it, it's not work for me. I'm a work tonight, but it's not going to be work. I work seven days a week. I don't have the, oh, it's Monday and hump day and oh my God, thanks, it's the weekend. It's because my work is my pleasure, literally. So how can you make your work your pleasure? Right. Either by, by only doing what you love to do through your delegation and all those things, delegating everything you don't want to do, say if you had your own business or even if you work for someone else, yeah. or you can link the things that you love to what it is that you have to do. And that makes life so easy. Yeah, it's been since I made that distinction. Even working at uh, Victoria's in two thousand. So since I made the oh, I'm going to make a list and do all this stuff. My life has been nothing but fun. Even though I, I was living on a hundred dollars a day in food, and I had to earn myself. And I'm like, oh, I'm getting rejected all the time, and and all these things. Yeah, uh, had to go from this place. It was easy to get rejected by BB and then go to the other BB and then go to Victoria's Secret because my number one thing on the list was I want to get dates uh, and, and I needed money. So if Victoria's Secret had said no, I would have been like, where's the – like I would have found – I don't know what right. my next thought would have been, but I would have been like, I'm at the mall. Let me see what other – where are um, – Jewelry store. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. Like, uh, yeah. I was like 23. Maybe I'll go work at Forever 21 or something. I mean I don't know yeah. what it would have been, but I would have found something else. That eventually, and then maybe there's, uh, okay, fine, I'm going to work at 
Nordstrom or something, right? Like, and there's women that go to Nordstrom. Yeah. If, if like all the way at the end, I would got rejected by everybody, but it's because I was very clear on what I wanted. Yeah. Even from Money, a, girls. Yeah. Exactly. It, and and yeah, not being homeless. Like literally, <laughs> that was such a. It's such a low level, non insp. I would say not. Um, what what people call it? Uh, like. Uh, special i don't know whatever like when people oh you need to be spiritual or whatever no yeah, like yeah. i believe you, everybody's Very spirituality yeah. yeah everybody's spirituality like your number one spiritual practice is going to be through your values because you're going to be giving the most to this planet and you will be rewarded by yeah. that because you're going to be the most aligned i already said it. you're going to be a genius you're going to be creative you're going to be unwavering in here yeah you're going to be the strongest and then other people that are going to be around you are going to be so inspired by you that they're yep. gonna be like, wow, I want to be like Ike. Yeah, you know, there he is selling bras, and like I got, there was I was the only guy that worked there, and within the three months when I got the raise, started running the store a little bit, there were like seven guys ended up working there afterwards, where wow. they hadn't had a guy ever right. work at that location, right? Because guys were like, oh man, this is actually cool. Yeah, uh, and then the business was also going well. You know, Ike yeah. really worked out. So That's one, one of the guys that I worked with back then, this is two thousand four. He still works at Victoria's Secret. No now. way! I saw him the other day at an Ike's opening, and he's still there. He That's made it his crazy. career. He only worked there because I worked there because he was like, "Oh, look at this guy." That's wild. There. He's still there. He still loves working there. That's wild. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you said something too that I want to I want to touch on as well because I think when you break down like energy levels, right? And what, like how it really works fundamentally is the lowest level is like depression, right? Shame, guilt, all of that stuff. But above that is like anger, right? So anger and like being like that in that feeling or a feeling kind of like that where you're like mad and you're like, I hate this and I wanna do something else. Anger can actually be a great tool for getting people out of depression and guilt and fear and all of that. And it can start the motivation for getting you up the like energy yeah. value chain, right? And at the top, what vibrates the highest and the highest form of energy is truth and authenticity. And that's kind of what you're getting to is like if you're aligned with your true values and like – you're doing it for love and that you want to do it and you're just being yourself right in those moments. And that is your work and that is your life. Cause I, I'm the same way. I, it's very hard for me to separate work in my life. It's like, they're like this. Cause I, you know, I'm doing events, I'm working, you know, we're doing this. Like I'll do content on the weekends, nights, all sorts of different stuff. Like I, I love networking. I love meeting people. I love bringing people together. Um, and I also just like love business, the game of business and all of that. Um, so I think it's like if people understood that and they could, if they, if you are in a very dark place, getting mad is a better emotion yes. and a better feeling than being depressed. And I think that can often be a pretty good first step for people. Obviously, you don't want to take your anger out on others, but getting mad and getting angry at where you are in your life is a better way of, is better than being depressed. And that can start making you motivated to start getting up to truth and being authentic. Cause that, if you look at all the top like media personalities now, if you look at some of the, you know, basically most famous and most successful people, they are like people like them and listen to them and watch them because they're being true and they're, they're being genuine and they're being themselves like Joe Rogan, like his show and podcast is by far the most watched show on TV, media, anything. And it's because he's real. He's the most real media personality that's been around and big for, for a while. Um, so people gravitate towards that. And they'll gravitate towards that, whether you're at a sandwich shop or whether you're at, you know, Victoria's Secret or whether you're wherever, they'll gravitate towards that. And then other people want to be around those companies, want to hire those people. Um, it's just the best form of energy to be around and it attracts other 
people like that too. When you're hiring, is that something you're, you're looking at? Like, how are you, how many people do you have working for you now? I mean, you have to be in the 1300. I was gonna say you have to be over a thousand. Um, so you have your probably core like operations corporate team and then yeah, you have corporate team is about 20 something like low twenties. Okay. Yeah. So how are you, how have you gone about hiring those, those people? Like well, what so are you looking for? Time, I was the only, like if you wanted a job at Ike's anywhere cashier, yeah. I was yeah. the only one that was allowed to interview people. I let other people sit in on the interviews, Yeah, I but for that. me, I'm, and if you're part of hiring in your business, I guarantee every single person you've ever hired that was a great hire or a bad hire, they told you that in the interview. Mm. So are we listening to it? So that was my belief 2007, 8, 9, 10. That I knew that everybody, you're going to tell me whether or not you're going to be great. And I either listened or didn't listen to my, uh, to the, how badly I needed people to work for me. Interesting. Because anybody can take and do an interview and be really good and charming and say the right. Hell, yeah. I've been the person that would be in an interview yeah. and be like, "Yes, you, yeah. I'm going to hire Ike." When I was like, "Oh yeah, these guys, yeah, I don't even care." Yeah. So, for now, when I was talking about doing what you love to do, um, either only doing what you love to do via delegation, or so now I've delegated the interviewing people, not because I don't like interviewing people or doing that. It's just if uh, somebody is not going to work directly with me, it's not really, I want to, well, a couple of things. want to empower the managers to feel like they can hire their own selves, yeah. uh, hire for them their own selves, but they got to work with that person. So what I might, my opinion might be this person sucks or not, and we shouldn't hire them, but you might vibe with them. Right. So, and your opinion is the only one that matters to you. Yeah. Now, if it's going to be a super high level person and they're going to actually work directly with me, then yes, I need to make sure that I vet them personally. Now, all that being said, we are strongly considering doing weekly or what a bi weekly um, or semi weekly interviews. We're on Zoom since sure. the 2020s, and I'm in there and I'm the ones doing the interviews. And I'll interview 20 people at once and do a group interview and see how things go and see if that we get better people that way. We're opening that because I'm not against interviewing people. I actually really enjoy doing the interview process as long as it doesn't interview, in, interfere with me handing out sandwiches and doing what I super <laughs> love to do. Yeah. But I also don't not love it. Yeah. Uh, so I don't what, – what we're taught, what we teach the people that are interviewing to look for is – how is it that they're what they value highly is in alignment with Ike's values? And so it started with, well, here's what our values are. And we've had people in the interview process were like, these are our values, this is our core of it. We've had people go, oh, actually, I don't want to work here because I don't want to stand for love, like whatever it is. Some right. people, it's been weird. I've been places yeah. where, like, oh, love isn't the name, I'm never going to eat there. So, wow. I mean, there are some people out there. Wow. And as always, their opinion is perfect for them. And then also, Pose to folks, your opinion is always the number one answer and is also the only one that matters. And if you're actually inspired by your life, then follow those. But if you're not inspired, if you're living a life and you're not inspired and you don't have great results, yeah, according to you, not according to me, according to you, right. then you should probably rethink what your opinion is right. straight up. Right. Uh, it doesn't matter how right your opinion is or how many people right. agree with your opinion. If your specific life sucks yeah. and you don't have the results that you want and you're yeah. not inspired, then you should probably change your opinion. Right. And that's just my opinion. And the only person's <laughs> opinion that matters to me is my own. Other right. than that, like it, it's not. So I'll throw that out there for yeah. folks that aren't living an inspired life, but are still holding firm on some opinions that might not be getting them the the life that they want. Right. Yeah. No. I I I play pay very close attention to who I listen to. Like obviously I you know take in a lot of information and stuff, but um, meaning I I listen to everything, but I discern okay who like who is this person right that I'm listening to right what's their life situation are they happy are they wealthy are do they have good relationships um is it someone that i want to be around or become in the future 
And if it's not those things, then I'm not really going to probably take action on their advice or what they're listening to, right? I think a lot of people are taking advice from people that they don't even want to be or that don't want to be where they are. Um, but I think if you're in a situation, right, where you're unhappy with where you currently are, well, you got to that place by the values and your habits and actions and thoughts and everything. So if you don't change your habits and thoughts and actions and environment and all that, the chances that you get what you want are very slim because if you're not making changes and you want new outcomes and you're putting the same input, <laughs> there's, there's not going to, you're going to get the same result. You know what I mean? So it's very like, it's simple, but it's like, you know, it's complicated in, in some ways, right? It's complicated for people to, to wrap their head around that. And some people are very stubborn with their ideas. Um, and, you know, they've had those ideas for a very long time and their parents had those ideas and stuff too. So it's hard to like break through a lot of that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you're spot on with it. Um, so what, what's, what's next for, for Ike's like, where, where are you trying to take things? I mean, you have, you know, over 200 locations, you said, or 120, yeah. 120 locations, right? You have over a thousand people working for you. You're, killing it you're opening up your fifth location here in austin um you have god knows how many in california <laughs> so like you say you're opening up one in michigan which is yeah, awesome coming up. so like what's what's next are you just going to keep going into new states new cities um is there anything else that you're working on what's 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 oh, next yeah, for you man stuff. though first i want to touch up on something that you said okay uh, when i first started getting into personal development i yeah. noticed that the people that were famous Influ and this is two, 2007, 2008, the people in, in the books, like the, the books to read and all these high, like the, yeah. these lists that I would see because I thought, oh, man, Ike's is going to make $3 million this year, and I'm a shitty leader. I'd like cuss people out, make people cry. I'm sorry if I made you cry. I owe you sandwiches for probably life. Um, and I wasn't proud of how, how I was showing up. But as I was getting into studying uh, leadership and, and entrepreneurship, I realized a lot of folks, and this is pertinent today more than ever, a lot of folks are following social media people or, or even book recommendations of people that don't even have the results that they want. Yeah. I, learned, I was studying with this, uh, I was studying some philosophy through this, um, through, through this one teacher, and I just Googled him, and I was like, dude, he makes, his net worth is like $10 million. Yeah. And I'm like, pfft. I I'm, I think Ike is going to be a billion dollar company. <laughs> right. I need to find billion dollar billionaire right. uh, mentors, and so one right. of the first books I got was um, Colonel Sanders' autobiography. And yeah, he's a mascot. Mm -hmm. I was a mascot, but his his deal at the time was the he was the KFC was the largest restaurant chain at the time. Yeah. In the United States, maybe even in the world. Yeah. So I was like, okay, he has a result that I want, and he is a founder, and, and yeah. it was from the '60s, and and he was worth the equivalent of like a couple hundred million dollars oh, yeah. in yeah. today's money. Yeah. And then Sam Walton's book. Yep. I mean, I know Walmart, that yep. I was in the the grocery business once upon a time, but I was like, this guy is a billionaire, created the largest thing, and so who, wh what are your actual results, and why are you following that social media influencer? Like. Even even now, like there's some social media influencers. Some of them are, are have gotten successful via like actually financially successful yep. and and business successful. But I'm like that guy only his business he's only like six hundred million dollars net worth. No, I need billionaire mentors. Right. I don't care like six hundred million is a lot. But like I feel like Ike's is worth a couple hundred million already. So I'm gonna learn for somebody six hundred million when I can go. Um, like some of my mentors are uh, the co-founder of Panda Express and yep. Churn. Like yep. he makes billions of dollars. A yeah, year and the company's it. worth that. So reaching out and, and studying through not higher than you, but where you want to get to. Yeah. Because he, he, so even though the person I was like, oh, he, he's got he makes like ten million bucks or he's worth ten million bucks. That's way more money than I had at the time. Right. But nowhere near where I want to get to. Exactly. And had I continued continuously done that or whatever influencer you are listening to, 
And money is not just the only successful barometer. Like if you want to study how to be a better podcaster, you, you should probably listen to Joe Rogan even if you don't like what he says. Yeah. Uh, it, um, same, same thing with like political ideology. You're likely not getting your political ideology from the actual politician that you're voting for right. or from the ones that you're not voting for. You're getting it from your peer group. Yep. So if your peer group it has a political ideologically, it doesn't matter what side or, or in the middle or on the fringes that right. you are. If you, they don't have the results that you want, then why the hell are you even listening to them, even if you agree with the pilot political ideology? Exactly. You can agree with it and right. not hang out around with those people that are, are being in that space. Whether you're right, left, middle, all the way right, all the way left, it's not really yeah. of any consequence because there are plenty of super successful people on both sides, yep. way left and way li- right, way successful, but it's not because of the political ideology – ideology it's because of stuff underneath the political ideology that they're also practicing yep. in conjunction with their political ideology so hang around those people i don't care if you're way left way right in the middle somewhere in between yeah if your peer group is not that then don't not hang out with them 100%. even if you even if you're like i will never vote for fill in the blank of your least right. favorite uh, politician yeah hang out with people that are successful within your own uh, sphere of awareness right. and if you don't then it doesn't matter how right you are politically or mentally or spiritually or religiously or emotionally. It doesn't matter yeah. how right you are. If you're not, if those people around you are, don't have the results that you want, don't listen to them. And I don't care what they say. Like right. literally don't listen to them. Somebody can come to me and say, Ike, we control our old destiny. We're all responsible for our own experiences. And you must do what you love to do. Like saying basically everything that I'm saying yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. But if they have shit results, I will right. not listen to them. Right. I'm like, sorry, I'm not going to listen to you. Exactly. Even though I agree with them 100%. And that's what's happening in twenty the 2020s as we're looking on social media. Oh, so-and-so is saying exactly what's mirroring what I feel. So I'm going to listen to this influencer or that influencer. But do, are they actually inspired in their life? Do they actually have results, success? According to you, it could be success. I want to have the largest clothing store ever. Or it could be I want to be a trillionaire. Like are they those things? Right. According to you, and if they're not – don't listen to them even especially if you agree with them don't listen to them because then they'll, they'll lead you in the path of oh there's only this way to do it when there's actually not it's what's underneath that counts yeah uh, uh the surface ideology whether that's political or religious or social or anything yeah 100 percent. i it took me a long time to realize that but as soon as i started like actually paying attention to who i listened to and doing that like since then it's just been, yeah, it's, it's been much better, but a lot of people get caught in the trap of like, not under, they're listening to friends, family, that sort of thing. And it's like, dude, even look at, like, look at your friends, like, look at your family's life. Like most of the time they're not, unless you come from a really great, successful, wealthy family, like the chances are your family and friends like that you grew up with or from your high school or college, they're usually pretty average by nature, right? The chances that they are wildly successful is, is very slim. Um, the other thing too, and this is why like personally, I didn't really like school that much, right? And I think you might have similar opinions on this too, but I looked at my teachers and I'm like, why am I listening to, and I felt this way, but I didn't know what I was I just like felt this way. I'm like, why am I listening to this teacher that isn't really happy? They're not that smart. I think I'm smarter than them. And this is like fifth grade and sixth grade, oh, and I've seventh I was grade. Smarter than my teacher when I was six years old. Maybe right. I probably wasn't. And but I'm like, I shouldn't be thinking that I am. And I'm right? like, why am I thinking that? Like, why don't I? There was literally one teacher that I've ever like actually wanted to learn from. Out of my whole, and I did, you know, like all high school, college, like I studied civil engineering. So I was taking math, science, engineering, like really hard, smart, like classes and what should be smart teachers and successful teachers, um, like throughout high school and college. And literally, it was like one of my last classes, uh, senior year, it was like project management. And I had a teacher and he like flew in from like Detroit and he would, he was like working on big construction projects and doing cool stuff. And I was like, all right, this is a guy that I actually want to learn from. All the other people were like teachers, 
They're like your your average, just like whatever, who had an average life, and most teachers don't even make that much money. And it's like, why am I learning whatever X Y Z? And a lot of people are doing business. They're taking business classes from business teachers that don't even have a business, no business, never even don't even make that much money. It's like, what are we doing here? Makes no sense at all. So yeah, that was really interesting for me, but I didn't like put two and two together and I didn't like treat that as a philosophy. And if I did, I would have been where I am now way faster, I think. Yeah, I totally, I was um, getting, uh, hanging out with some family pretty recently and uh, one of my family members was giving me advice on on business and what he was saying on the surface was actually I was like oh yeah that that probably is but and then I immediately said to him like hey look you're not in the position to be giving anybody business advice I'm not saying that you're wrong just looking at your life you shouldn't give anybody business advice by yourself right so I'd appreciate it if like you don't tell me what I I don't need your your opinion not because I don't want to hear it but when it comes to business, I'm just be like, okay, well, why haven't you done that yet then if since it's such a great plan? And then it was like crickets, obviously, anything. And then, um, you know, since I was talking about social media influencers earlier and just as if you look through the history of life, history of knowledge, history of wisdom, there are those that are popular because they speak to the masses and the ones that are actually wise – they had very, very, very few students. In fact, how I, what, what social media um, people I follow, influencers I follow, if, if the le- less followers they have, the more I think that their message is more wise because they're speaking to people, they're speaking to the masters, and that's why they don't have a million followers or, right. or 10 million or 40 million followers. I see all these big folks on social media specifically or even uh, – some podcasts too that they're like so many it's because they're speaking to the masses there unless somebody's a legit like a list celebrity right. or flying in the face of of conventional wisdom to the extent that they're able to amplify that everyone else including you, probably your favorite person to follow well but not your favorite person the person that you follow that has the most followers because we probably have similar favorite people but the ones that are the, like the, like multi-million followers they're speaking to the masses and i don't want to I don't want to hear that their message because they're not speaking to me. I'm not saying they're not, they're not saying anything that's valuable or even truthful, but they're not speaking to me. And they're, they're, even though those people might be wildly successful, they're only going to take you to a superficial level. And, right. But when you want the, the like the some of the people I follow tremendously, like Dr. John D. Martini, NLP Marin on social media, they have I don't know tens of thousands of followers, but they're actually speaking the truth. Um, not truth in a way that the other people aren't speaking truth, but like this is wisdom, but they're speaking to the masters and that's why they only have 80,000 followers. Right. So in the case of NLP Marin, like 2,000 followers. It's because you're going to, you're going to, somebody's going to come to that, the regular TikTok user or the Instagram user and they're going to go, oh, I can't, this doesn't make sense to me. Or they don't understand yeah. it. Yeah. They don't understand it's it. Too... Where if you, like, maybe you don't even know of these people, but if you yeah. went to their, their post, you'd be like, holy crap, yes, follow. Right. But it takes a, a special whatever. So for me, I don't follow any of the multi-million yeah. uh, influencers yeah. uh, other than Taylor Swift. No, <laughs> I don't follow her actually. <laughs> I'm not a Swifty, but you know, I'm not not one either. Yeah. I don't follow any multi-million uh, people other than the ones I actually literally know right. because they're not spewing anything that's actually useful to where I'm at. They're spewing yeah. something that's useful for the algorithm or useful for some basic person on social media. So I, I, I urge you, if you are following some influencer that's like 30 million followers, comment, like ask them what their influence was. And it's probably somebody that you've not heard of and somebody that has like 20,000 followers and go follow that person instead of the 30 million mm. follower because you're going to get more useful to you knowledge in your own opinion too. It won't be my right, opinion. Right. You'll, you'll go there and be like, Oh, actually, if I pay attention to this person, I'm getting more value from so-and-so than I am from fill in your favorite 10 million right, follower right, right, right. followers. Yeah. It's persona. almost like the, you know, they're like the front facing, but then there's someone behind the curtain that actually taught them or yeah. like they, yeah. And they have, 
they're more accessible even too. So you'll even be able to probably for sure, you know, and, and get to know less them and stuff. It. They're let, yeah. I like. I know folks that taught Robert Kiyosaki, and folks. I have mentors that taught Tony Robbins, and and we could go go down the line like people that are. Yeah. Oh my God! You know, you know this person and this. I'm like, I know I learned from their teachers. Yeah. Because they were and they spoke in a way that inspired and awakened a giant to so to right. to use. Yeah. His own words. They awakened a giant, and so I'm going to learn from the person that woke the giant, not from the giant. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's so smart, man. That's so smart. Okay, so getting back to what's next yeah, okay, <laughs> for you yeah, before we wrap up here. Cool. So what's next for you? Like what's what's on your roadmap coming up now? So for Ike's, the goal is to get it to be the second biggest sandwich chain ever. reason why I don't say biggest is Subway's at like 40,000 or whatever that is. And, and I feel like that that's a disservice to Subway that they have that many locations. Mm. Uh, they're actually, I've heard, not doing that well. They're, they're not, which is and surprisingly, seems they like just sold Jersey for 9.6 Mike's, billion. Uh, Jimmy yeah. John's are in a much like healthier Well, they, they are also, state. so Jimmy John, one, he's really passionate about sandwiches. Yeah. And he, he's kind of like a dictator when it comes to, this is how we make the sandwiches. Whether you like Jimmy John's or not, personally, I've only eaten Jimmy John's twice, and I'm and likely I won't unless Jimmy's yeah. feeding me They're himself. They're pretty, like, yeah. bland. It's right. just like, you but know what you're getting? But he's passionate about sandwiches, and that's the main thing. It doesn't yeah. matter what you're doing. It matters that he cares. And right. so, and then same with the, some other ones. So I feel like 5,000 in one location, somewhere put us at number two on the list. Uh, maybe that's just in the U.S. And then internationally, we do another 10 yeah. or so thousand. But I have no desire to be at 50,000 restaurants like uh, Subway is at, or 40, yeah. whatever the number that they're at. Even And they've been closing locations too. Um, but Ike's is going to get there. And the thing is, it's it, for me, it's uh, it doesn't matter because it's only a matter of time. Yeah, It took me 16 years to get to 100 locations, a little bit less than 16 years. And it'll probably take 10, 10 years to get to 1,000 locations. I'm not really worried about it. And yeah. all we care if we all we care about is love and sandwiches. We'll get to 5,000 locations whether that's 5 years, 10 years, 15, right. 20, 30 uh, and all that. Yeah. And I also have a because one of my mentors is Andrew Churn. Um, they've been doing it for f- over 40 years, and maybe even 50 approaching, and he's got 2,000 something restaurants. Yep. So I know the only difference between me and him is he's like 30 it's time. years ahead of me. It's time. And, and for sure in 30 years I'll have a 1,000 locations if not th- 5,000 locations, right? almost guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed, but I can, if I'm holding the vision and yeah. we're getting there and as long as sandwiches don't get made illegal by some <laughs> right. some kind of fascist government or something, like I right. feel like I'm going to get there. Yeah. Um, and I say that kind of jokingly because I did get closed down for selling sandwiches in San Francisco because I wasn't allowed to open up a restaurant in the first location. So I kind of say that facetiously, mm. but also I did get shut down because I wasn't allowed to have a restaurant. Um, so just in case that doesn't, if that doesn't happen everywhere, then yeah. I should get to 5,000 locations, 10,000 locations. And I once, uh, rest in peace, Bob Proctor, I promised him that I would get to 5,001 locations. So I got to get to 5,001 yeah. locations. At a minimum for him, he's a huge sandwich lover. So I told him I was going to get to 5,001. And just because he doesn't exist on this plane anymore yeah. doesn't mean I won't get there. I love that. But my side, my side gig, actually probably the thing I spend more time on than actual uh, in-store time, uh, is I speak and I coach a lot of folks. My ideal person to work with is somebody that is in business already yep. and then has at least two of whatever they're doing because while I said the hardest part is starting the first one, the next hardest part in the journey is the decision to go from I have this one retail or one restaurant to not having to be a perfectionist to open up the second one. I feel like anybody that has two of anything, it doesn't matter what it is, I can show them how it's easier to get to 100 than it was to open the first two. Mm. And it really is. It's been, I have 120 something restaurants and I'll have another, whatever, 200 in like two years or so, or maybe yeah. three years. And it's easier for me having 120 restaurants than it was to open the first one right. and to open the second one and then open the third one. It's easier running that. Yeah. And so I, I do a lot of speaking. I recently launched my YouTube channel. It's Vote yeah. for Ike Shahada. Uh, and that's that I've posted 12 videos. I just launched it on November 1st. Okay. So I don't have too many I've videos I've been watching up. the content oh, on. Yeah. I love, I just saw, uh, 
recently you uh you made a sandwich with a uh, watermelon and avocado yeah, and that seems oh. to be flipping people out they don't like it <laughs> it was probably the worst not the, uh, the out of the cool sandwiches that i've been making it's probably the lowest rated one i've given uh so far yeah. but it seems to be flipping people out but that, that's the thing is i it's love controversy making, yeah, i love you just to make sandwiches combine anything yeah. and somebody was like oh i should follow you because you came up with this crap and i've literally responded this morning i said hey look if you watch the review I gave myself a bad review. So if anything, that's how you should know that you should follow my opinion right. on reviews. Because if I'm willing to give myself the lowest score I've ever given anybody on right. social media, right. nobody I've not given anybody a lower score than the score I've up until now yeah. uh, than myself, then you should be like, oh, I should trust his reviews because he gave yeah. himself – I'm the lowest ranked uh, Ike's review of all time is right. myself. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and it's a basically sandwiches and – teaching right. slash coaching. I do have my website. It's learnfromike.com. I have a lot of free stuff on there, although, and, he, and here's an example why not to do stuff for free. So I have a lot of free stuff yep. on my thing. The free stuff gets consumed. I, I do a free every other Tuesday class, and the first nice. one got a bunch of people and then started tapering off. Yep. Now, like, two people, and not even the same two people, show up for a free one-hour discussion yep. on things. When I did this class called Full Mental Alchemist early, yeah. earlier in the year, and yeah. I did it for free, and same thing, like one or two people yeah. per week, and not even the same one or two people, right. be like different one or two people maxed yeah. out at like five people. I ended up, I go, you know what? F forget this. I charged $8,888, and I got 27 people to sign up <laughs> for the same, like literally, it's the same other thing. than That's you crazy. ask questions, yeah. and so it was slightly different because yeah. I had more, more participants. Q&A, yeah, yeah. Q &A. Other than that, the actual like content because I wrote this book called yep. uh, "The Alchemy of Magic" and I go through uh, go through the book. Love it. Literally word for word. I'm literally reading from my own book, so it's basically word for word. Two people would show up for free. Twenty seven people for almost ten thousand dollars. So I'm I'm right currently still doing till the end of yeah. uh, 2023. So I don't know when this is gonna come out. Free. I got two more, three maybe three more free free classes yep. this year and at the end of this year because i committed to doing it free for a year yep. i'm gonna charge it yeah. for it because if three people are gonna show up for free i promise you when i'm like it's a yeah. hundred dollars a class right. like 10 people will sign up right because people and we already know this people are going to get the value that they pay for yep. no matter what there's yep. been studies on it you give th people three different cups of wine and it's literally the same wine but say this one costs five dollars this one costs a yep. hundred and this one costs a thousand that yeah. They're all going to say the $1,000 one is the better one, even though it's literally the same one. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. We're, we're getting ready to roll out like a learning section um, within our app. And like we really want to start figuring out how to empower people through education and being surrounded by like good teachers at the same time being able to like make actionable steps to like whether it's starting a company or whether it's finding a job, changing careers, or just pursuing those things that they really want to do um, and helping them take those first steps. So that's awesome, dude. Um, as we wrap up here, where where can people learn more about you? Like, feel free. To, I know you're posting a yeah. lot of content now. You mentioned your, your coaching site. Um, what's the main site for the sandwich shops? Um, where should people be? Like, how should people be finding a location near them? And then where should people follow you on social? So, probably the, the best way to see what I'm up to is to follow me on social media. It yep. doesn't matter which one. I'm the same. It's Ike Shahada, S-H-E-H-A-D-E-H, -E although I'm sure you'll yep. pop yeah, it up. We'll, yeah, we'll. It's at Ike Shahada on literally every single social media, whether it's a uh, clubhouse or snapchat or instagram <laughs> yeah. or tiktok or even be real perfect it's all that and and from there it's probably going to be the the most useful thing for anybody that because they'll have sandwiches on there they'll have yep. coaching stuff stuff on there and it's free because it's instagram although i do yep. have a subscription thing that they get really deep more deep information yep. on there um and then my my website is learnfromike.com again it's free for now go there gobble it up while it's free um you're probably not going to i have several hundred people on my email list and only two people show up <laughs> on average Take advantage for, of for a free class even though i'm like crazy. hey by the way there's a free class tonight in an hour yeah. and you're like nah never mind i don't want it yeah. uh and the same people that are reaching out to me for personal coaching like you'll pay me 1200 dollars to talk to you for 30 minutes but you won't watch a one hour class for free 
it's crazy. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but Ike's website is ikessandwich.com. You can Ike's find sandwich. the location closest Perfect. to you. I'm a better follow on Instagram than Ike's, so follow me, and then you'll see Ike's stuff on there too. But ikesandwich.com, learnfromike.com. And if you want, my, I just launched my podcast and my things, and that's at Vote for Ike Shahada. That's on YouTube. Vote for and there's uh, two or three episodes on there, plus another whole bunch of other, like, 15 or so episodes. All right. Yeah. Well, Ike, thanks so much for coming, man. Um, love what you're doing. Wish you, you know, get to the 5,001 sh- stores, which I know you will. And uh, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate your time. This was, like, awesome just to sit down with you. Excited for the uh, the store opening tonight, yeah, too. Man. Yeah. But, uh, I appreciate pre- you, too. Thanks for all that you do and what you post and your contribution to humanity. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, man. Well, this was good. Uh, until next time, everyone. Cheers. Oh, th- there's one thing that I do want to say is I want anyone listening to know, and they've probably been told otherwise, is that your well-being is your greatest contribution to humanity. And there's no exceptions ever to that. I love that. Well, that's a great way to wrap up. Thanks, man. You're this welcome. is dope. I-